I've seen the Huron come and go by white man's hand. They were good to me. So we go like this. You want to stand back so you don't get this in your eyes. But, but rice harvesting is a tradition that's been around since the Anishinaabek people came here. It's very important um, to them because um, it's part of their migration story. Uh, the Anishinaabek people used to live on the northeastern um, part of this, what's now the United States, and they were visited by prophets. and. Two of the prophecies directed them to travel westward to the place where food grows upon the water. If they didn't travel westward, they would be destroyed. And so they started following um, the setting sun and began the migration route that took hundreds of years to complete and ended up coming down the St. Lawrence and up around up to Sault Ste. Marie, Mich what's now Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. They split into two groups and went north and south coast of Lake Superior. Ended up over in Minnesota near uh, Spirit Island and Madeline Island in that area where they found rice and knew that they were home. Well there were also um, other tribal people here before the Anishinaabe came. Up there I hear stories at Waters Meet at Lac Desire of the um, Dakota and the wars that the Chippewa had with the Dakota over rice um, because they didn't want to lose their rice beds or their hunting areas because it was very rich there. But the uh, Ojibwe people went out and pushed the Dakota westward. The, the wild rice is very, very important still to the Anishinaabe communities. It's used in um, all kinds of ceremonies. It's used uh, as a staple for their food. It's very nutritious, high in protein. Um, and the tradition of ricing has been lost um, to a lot of the tribes in Michigan because of, I think, because of the fact that, number one, we've lost a lot of the rice beds over time um, for a variety of reasons, but also the whole boarding school experience that a lot of the native folks went through where their um, culture was interrupted. A lot of the tradi traditions were lost. Um, some areas where the people are, are living now, they didn't have a lot of rice there, so they don't, they don't have stories of ricing. Um, they don't know if they did ricing back in the old days. But we're trying really hard to bring rice back and ricing back. And um, so what I'm gonna share with you today is what I was taught by Charlie and Roger um, about how to make the tools for ricing and <clears throat> how to process it. When you go ricing, um, you do ceremonies in the springtime. Roger goes to the water and puts tobacco down, puts a sema down to honor the water spirits and to ask creator for a good um, harvest and honors the wild rice as well. And the tool making, as you'll see, um, you have to go out at different times of the year to harvest the, the materials for you making your tools. So you'd go out and harvest cedar to make your cedar sticks, ricing sticks. You'd harvest birch bark for making a winnowing tray. Um, you'd harvest a spruce pole or a tamarack pole for your push pole. And in the fall, they go hunting for deer and you use deer skin to make your moccasins um, for dancing on the rice. So it's really a year long um, process and we always condense it down into these short two or three or four day workshops now but really to have uh, have the, the real traditional way for you go out and get the materials to make your tools it takes a year and um, if you want pine uh, cedar when, when did you cut your cedar? Well, you can go you can get the cedar I think any time but it has to be dry when you are going to carve it into your stick, so you got to let it get seasoned. The same with your push pole. A lot of times what I see is when I drive by 
some of the highways cut off the water, you know, and the trees die. You see this along 127 North. There's huge stands up there of, um, I think, think it I thought it was tamarack but it might be spruce I'm not sure but you could see these long skinny poles deader than a doornail and those are perfect you know as long as they're not all split up to take and cut up into your um, push poles the the birch bark I believe um, the winnowing trees I've seen are usually summer bark but I suppose you could probably get winter bark as well which is the darker kind that so you can do etching on it um, and then the spruce root, I've harvested that at different times of the year. I don't know that there's a special time. There may be, but I've never never been told about that. Barb, when you harvest the um, birch bark, are you harvesting that off of trees that have already fallen down? Or I, I have not harvested um, birch bark, but they, do, they go out and get it off of trees that are usually with, they go out where the, in forest service lands where they're going to have a timber cut. So they'll go where they they know the trees are going to be cut down, mm -hmm. and but usually you just take it off of a live tree. The dead the trees that are down the bark loses its properties for um, being able to work with it very well. So, yeah. yeah and birch, if you take it off a live tree, doesn't it just? It makes it it makes a corky kind of thing. It never grows back the paper the white bark, 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 but it doesn't but it kill doesn't it. Kill the tree. Mm -mm, as long as you. Don't That's why you just go just down. Yeah. You know, yeah. So the traditional um, rice camps are when rice was harvested, and they occurred in the fall every year when rice season was ready. Um, the tribes all had a rice chief. Some in Wisconsin, Minnesota, still do have rice chiefs, and the rice chiefs keep track of the rice beds, and they know when the rice is ready for harvesting. They know. When, when it's time to say rising season is open and they know when it's time to close the rising season. And they really take care of the rising beds. Um, but the rice camps themselves were, um, used to be, you see, for, even in the 1960s, you could see old photographs where there would just be, you know, lines of pickup trucks and canoes and people coming from all over to go rice harvesting and it was a real celebratory time of the year. A lot of the tribes would have a wild rice festival or a feast um, following the harvest to honor, honor, honor the rice as well. And the rice camps now in Michigan, um, we're just, we've been since 2008, started to offer those at Lac Vie Desire. Roger teaches those primarily with Charlie and, and then Roger's brother helps to um, to help bring those traditions back. And those camps are open to anyone. It doesn't matter if you're native or non-native. Usually it's mostly native people up there, but it's a really great opportunity to um, learn about rice and really get a sense of the community aspect of ricing because that, to me, that's one of the beautiful things about it is having that time um, with each other that you get once a year. Um, and then in the, in the way that rice is processed, which we'll go through the, the way it is once we get the fire going, um, that's a, a time when there was a lot of bonding and storytelling and sharing, especially at the, at the cleaning table at the end. After the rice is all processed, you go through a final cleaning phase to make sure you get all the grains out that still have their hulls on them. And usually that's children and, and the elders are sitting at the table doing that. And that's a lot of stories and laughter at those tables and a lot of philosophical discussions. It's really fun to sit and listen to that. That's what the woman who, you know, when the poster went out last year. Mm -hmm. and Beautiful poster. Um, I got an email from this woman in Colorado and she was like, oh my gosh, that takes me back to when I was a young girl. And, you know, and she lived mm -hmm. along, she, along Lake Huron, she says. And I just remember, you know, sitting with all the women and they were talking and gossiping about everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. She was like, oh, I want to share this with my grandkids. I left that long ago, but mm -hmm. it took her nice. back to it. Nice. You get, you get that a lot at the rice camps. The elders will come and they'll get tears in their eyes because they remember when they were children mm -hmm. doing this and their grandparents doing it and how much it means to them to have this come back to them. So it's, it's a wonderful experience. Um, so what we're gonna do today is um, 
I'm going to show you how to start on your rising sticks um, and then I'm going to get the fire going so that we can start processing so you can see how that's done. We'll do it both by the traditional way of dancing it and then by the mechanical way of a processing machine that goes a lot faster. <laughs> if, if you have a lot of rice to process and it's just you, right? This used to be a community thing or a family thing, right? And yeah, as in even non-native traditions, food traditions, we don't do it anymore. You know, if you think about my family, they harvested, uh, used to harvest nuts and um, big mushroom hunters and they don't do any of that anymore. But when we did it, we were all together as a family. That was a family bonding time. And we're, every, I think every culture is losing that, and at least in this country, all those old traditions of doing things together. We used to go to the U-Pick farms and mm -hmm. pick any, anything that was in season. We'd go with mom and pick it and come home and can and freeze. And we grumbled about it, but mm -hmm. I cherish that. You know, I was, and, and I agree, because I used to take my kids, but I know my children don't, don't take great kids. Mm -hmm. And it was, we would do that like every other weekend. We'd, yeah. You know, if it was strawberry season, raspberry season, yep. apple, yep. pear, <laughs> yep. whatever. Yeah. I was thinking this year when I was out harvesting the wild black raspberries, you know, here I was doing it alone. I mean, I wasn't mm -hmm. totally doing it alone because there were spirits with me, but that was something that I did with my three sisters with my father. Mm -hmm. And we'd put on long pants and long sleeve shirts because we were in, you know, it was in real dense woods and and he'd tell stories and, you mm -hmm. know, sing, we'd sing songs together and it was, you know, it is something that, you know, is really missing, you know, just... It is. And that's what this group does. It brings us together to do more yeah, of that. Mm -hmm. grateful that I'm able to share it with my granddaughter. Absolutely. Yeah, because you're going to be the one to teach when we're gone, you're going to be the one to carry those traditions on. That's what it's all about, really. We're mm -hmm. just tradition carriers for the next generations. Please be careful with the tools you're using today so that you don't cut yourself. I have a, a first aid kit and limited bandages. I do have a stomach bandage, though I've always wanted to use. So if you do, <laughs> <laughs> like they do on TV, you know. <laughs> Quick, grab it. <laughs> Boom. That well, would just be so fun. <laughs> we got a tool for that. <laughs> I know that once once we get the process going, feel free to socialize and all that, but, but because we have a lot to focus on today, I would um, request that we really try to stay focused on what we're doing today, especially because this is a sacred thing that we've been, um, I've been very blessed to have this shared with me. And so when you're th we're thinking about doing this work and making your rising stick, do this with a good heart. Especially when we're processing our um, rice, I was taught that whenever you're processing food like this, you should never talk about things that are, are troublesome or bad or talk bad about other people. Everything you do and say goes into the food that you eat when you're preparing it. And when we process rice, this food is, this rice will go to other people. And so we want to always make sure that we send that with love. You know, the tree grows like this. So the, the base of the tree is what your handle is. And you carve upward from the earth to the sky. Otherwise, if you carve the other direction, you gouge into the wood. And the wood comes out. And, and this way you get a nice smooth um, shaving on it. But you can see how thick these are. There's a little, a little bit of difference. Um, it just depends on your comfort level. You want it to feel light and balanced in your hand. What you do is you pull the rice plant over the boat like that, and then you hit the stick. And then you pull the rice plant over, hit the stick, and that vibration knocks the rice down into your canoe. So it's right like this. So you always want to have sticks that are comfortable and light in your hand. So like Karen's there, that may be comfortable for her, I don't know, but if she holds on to this narrow one. Yeah, this is a little bit easier. A little easier? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so that's, what you're, down more. that's what you're shooting for, okay? This one has and, a <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The other thing 
besides harvesting rice is the most laborious part is the processing which if you're going to harvest rice you're going to have to process rice so always remember that you never want to go out and pick rice and then leave it to rot okay so the other thing you need for processing is a paddle this is also i carved it out of cedar this is my speed paddle it has air holes in it knots um, and then you need a parching tub a round wash tub like that that you season, melt the galvanized stuff off, and then season with olive oil over the. Let it sit there for a long time. And you can see it drip off. Really? Yeah, it's yeah, it's very toxic. You don't want to smell it. You don't want to stay anywhere near the fumes. Um, you can also use copper. Copper heats hotter, and it's it's uh, easy to burn the rice that way. Some people use cast iron, but. Traditionally, most people, because they were inexpensive and plentiful, wash tubs. You can get those at the antique stores or flea markets or places like that, but you have to get the galvanized off of it. And right here, like that, to hold that steady. There you go. Give you some leverage. Get it. Oh, smell it. Oh, that's beautiful. It's almost not like a closet I would like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect tool. This is a draw knife. This was my grandpa's. And this is the tool you would use for, I'm going to find an easy one, the next step. What you do is you pull it, pull it toward you, like that. And you see how it goes nice and smooth, long, easy pieces. The goal is to round, round this off. So this is kind of your shaper. Now, when you go this direction, notice how it's digging in, it's gouging in. That's how you tell. I'm going sky to earth right now, and that's just gonna be a big old mess. So you say, well, what do you do to get up here to go that way? Well, you just flip it around and flip this around. And then you can go like, in this direction, but it takes a little finesse. You gotta get used to this direction. And then um, from there, you take a planer and then you just run it like that around and around and around and it'll smooth it right out and get rid of all of the ridges and stuff that you've accumulated from using the draw knife. And once you get the shaver done, um, the this done, then you can use sandpaper to make it nice and smooth like those other rising sticks are. If you have a knot, um, which I don't, yeah, there's a, uh, oh, I forgot what the heck it's called. It's kind of like a, it's a rasper, so you can rasp over that and knock it down a little bit if you want to. The rasper here will help us if we have a knot to sh grate it off. It's like a grater, yeah, yeah. to take that knot down. <laughs> kind of old it. Well, that much rest. And <clears throat> then you just start stirring it and you stir it like you're paddling a canoe. Like that. See how it's smoking? That means it's hot. And um, 
What you don't want is to burn the rice, okay? What will happen is it will start popping like popcorn. It pops the rice, and you don't want that. So you want to keep a close eye and keep listening for any kind of popping sounds coming from the rice. You can see it's starting to get some dark. Uh, dark stuff in the back there. It's burning the ons off. What is the part of the rice? What is that? A, you call it a husk? Or? Uh, the hull. The outer covering is the hull and then it's got a little tail on it. It's called an on. That actually acts like the rudder. When the rice falls in the water, it shoots it down, straight down into the muck. Trying to see if you can hear popping. So a lot of times when people do this, they'll be talking and they're saying, can you believe that blah, 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 blah. And pretty soon this is smoking and <laughs> you have to always pay attention when you're parching. Always. If you parch a long time you can carry on a conversation, but I'm listening every second to this rice as I'm talking. You always have to keep it moving. The minute you stop you're gonna If we hear this start to pop, you pull it off the fire right away and you keep stirring it. If you let it sit there when you pull it off, it'll also burn. It takes about 10-15 minutes and you roll it between your fingers and see if the hull slides off easily. If it does, it's done. When we make a dancing pit, this is where we're going to be putting the rice after we parch it. We have to get the hulls off of it. So we put on moccasins and we dance on the rice to rub off the hulls. And so in order to do that, we create a, a dancing pit, a hole in the ground. And in the Wisconsin, Minnesota, I've heard that there's, there's like archeological sites where the dancing pits are still visible um, from long ago. But what we have to do, Skylar, I'm going to have you do this part, is we want to make this, uh, clean this out, and it's got to be as smooth as possible. No stones, no anything in the bottom of this bowl, because it'll tear through our tarp. So what we'll do is we'll go in and scoop out all of, this, of the leaves, make sure we don't have any bugs in there or stones, no roly-polies. I'm just going to gently put them out. Yeah. And put them, put them that direction because we're going to have a tarp right here and they'll get smashed if you put them back there. So put them toward the tree here, up that way. Yep, we want to put oh, her. Oh. Wrong way, dude. So we pat her down. Ah! And earwig! Oh, better pull that one out. Nope. I am not touching earwigs. Come on, little earwig. I hate, I hate earwigs. Go on, that way. All right, we got it. Next, what we do is we take these poles, and because everybody who processes rice, you have to know how to make the dance pit. Skyler, you want to come over here? I need somebody to just stand in that hole there, just like we have this one. But you're gonna put it right on the side there. Can you hold that one too, Skyler? Oh. All right, now. The height that we want to have the pole, you want to be able to stiff arm when you dance the rice to lift your body off the, the weight of the your weight off the rice a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if you were dancing on the rice right now, can you take your body weight off if you were to push no. on this at all? Needs to go higher? Needs to go higher for me. Anyway. About like that? Yep. It's kind of more pressure okay. on me. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, you hold it real steady and we're gonna tie it right there. Are they? Yeah. Okay, we're hurrying. Alright, how's that? Yeah. Good? Yeah. Alright, so tie it off. Now the next step is that we are going to pull the tarp under the um, logs. And then you never, ever, ever step on this tarp with shoes on. Ever. Uh -oh. Got it? Yep. Never? No, no, after we unfold it. Never ever. Because this is where we're going to put our moccasins on and dance. If you, if you go on this tarp with shoes that have dirt on them, 
anything that you put on a tarp is going to go in the rice. And you cannot get dirt out of rice, no matter what you do processing it. And then we'll pull this up so that the, this covers the hole. And there we go. Wow. And there inside. Yep. Beautiful. The grain of rice. Where do you get your moccasins? Does somebody make them for you? Or? I made them. Oh, you made them? Okay. Yeah. I took a design I saw for a regular Chippewa style moccasin and then I modified it to make it into a racing moccasin. Oh, it's good winnowing wind. What kind of a... So what I'm going to do is dump in the rice. And then you dance and it's taking a step like this and a twist. Step, twist, step, twist, step, twist. And so you want to be able to keep some of your weight off of here. So you go like this. I'm using my whole feet. I think we can call this good. So you want to take all of that out of there and put it in the when it, yeah, put it in that birch bark basket there. And you can see the rice grains. Which rice are the grain. black. Yeah, black. which are the black. So now we have to get rid of the hulls, the chaff. To do that we winnow it. So the proper way to do it, you know how when you want to flick water out of a paintbrush, you flick like that? Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing with this. We're not throwing this up in the air, we're dropping the basket down. So we go like this. You want to stand back so you don't get this in your eyes or on your skin because it'll itch. And find the way the wind's blowing. That'll work. You use the wind to your advantage. So what I like to do is when the wind's blowing, wow. if when the wind's blowing, <laughs> it'll blow some of the chaff away when the wind's blowing. Come. Still breathe. <laughs> well, until the wind's blowing. There you go. Okay, who's next? Well, this is the this is the machine, and we'll see how it works. It's still being tweaked. Did you make that? No, Marie's boyfriend Pete made it for me. Oh my gosh! And I'm actually giving it to Roger and Charlie as a gift <gasps> oh. for teaching me. And then hopefully Pete will make me one, another one. So if um, it's going to be blowing chaff up in the air, uh -huh. and if you get it on you get and you're sweaty, it's really, really itchy. So you know. Wow! Cool! Isn't that amazing? That's cool. So we're going to check it. Do? No, I'm just going to check and see how it's doing. If it's pounding away or if it's still... Got some nice whole pieces. It's not breaking it up. Well, this... this uh, Rod here spins, these arms spin, and this is um, some kind of radiator hose. And it rolls over the grains and pulls the hulls off, rolls the hulls off. 
And then it's got a blower over there that blows all the chaff up out the tube. I'll tell you in a second. This step here is for um, separating out the broken pieces from the whole grain. Should I check? In a second. You see how we get the broken pieces out, and you, you use do it above you there. use that to make uh, soups and casseroles. <laughs> you just stir, stir your fingers around like that. The goal is when you get to this stage that you don't have any of this left. You've got it all parched nice, and when you dance it, all the hulls come off. But we don't have that, so we go to the next step, which is called cleaning during the final cleaning. And I found that if you put them on these flat trays and spin it around a little bit like that. That's cool. You can get the hulls, the ones with hulls to kind of gather like that. And so... It kind of looks like a headless guy. Mm -hmm. So what you do initially is we just grab these areas that have a lot, like I said, we normally you wouldn't, you would try not to have this much because the final cleaning will take a long, lot longer to do. Try not to get the rice though, hon. We just want to get the uh, ones with the hulls. So we pull that. That's a nice. Whoa, whoa. Essentially, we do that, and then I might spin it around a little bit more. See if I can get it to congregate. This all goes back in the dance pit or back in the parching pit. Uh -huh. These holes, we don't just throw them away. Some people, when they're first learning, they start picking the, hole, the green out of the holes, and that's like a big waste of time. Mm -hmm. I have my favorite pair of tweezers. <laughs> and then it's picking them out one at a time or two at a time if you're a good grabber until you can get all of them out of the rice. Good. This, this batch will take a while to get all the rice out. Should go get a drum, huh? I do. Okay, my feet are all tired out. Okay, I'll swap you.